This pandemic began, we were not sure how it spread. Everyone began wearing masks and using hand sanitizers. Great ways to slow the spread, but a lot of people still get sick. I can personally attest to that. We now know that COVID-19 spreads via aerosols and droplets from the nose and mouth. And I've been thinking about this for a while. Why aren't we also sanitizing the nose and mouth, killing the virus directly at the place where it spreads? Why weren't more doctors thinking about this? Well, some doctors have done the research. Wish I discovered it sooner. That's why I'm excited to tell you about Halidine. It's an FDA-registered antiseptic for the nose and mouth that's proven to eliminate 99.99% of the virus that causes COVID-19 in just 15 seconds. That's right. It's created by a team of clinicians with decades of experience in antiviral treatments, initially created to protect healthcare workers. These are smart scientists, and it's a great product that also eliminates many other viruses and infecting particles. I'm using both their nasal antiseptic swab and their oral spray to help protect those around me, and you should be too for others and for yourself. Whether you're hopping on a three-hour flight, always use it there, visiting grandparents or attending a meeting that you can't miss, Halidine's family of oral and nasal antiseptics give you the safe, easy, on-the-go antiviral protection for up to four hours. I encourage you to try Halidine at halidine.com today. My listeners get 10% off with the discount code Dr. Drew. That is H-A-L-O-D-I-N-E.com, discount code D-R-D-R-E-W. So obvious, it just makes sense. dot com slash Dr. Drew. Again, that's H-Y-D-R-A-L-Y-T-E dot com slash D-R-D-R-W. And be sure to use our code Dr. Drew 25 at checkout for a special discount. Hey, everyone. It's a dose of Dr. Drew. Indeed it is. Thank you for joining us today. We're having uh, no phone calls, but we are sitting on the restream. And really quickly, uh, the Hydrolyte ad, they could have not here, but everybody knows all about it. So, um, We'll work that out. Where we was the first? I think the first ad played though. So uh, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, but our friends at Hydrolyte, of course, we've been using their products for a long oh, time boy. for hydration. And uh, Halidine, it really does. You know, we we had a really great conversation yesterday about aerosols and the transmission of COVID. This is another reason to be using things in addition to mask and the Halidine swab and and uh, mouthwash really do add to the efficacy of masks. So. We do it routinely, particularly when we travel. So We really love our sponsors. We appreciate all of you. And, of course, Blue Mike. And if you like the, the sound of this voice. My <laughs> OBS went out. and Just now? Just, no, well, we had a glitch in it the other day, and mm. it just, everything had to be reset. So I apologize. You guys just have to deal. Okay. Half of the hydrolyte worked good, they said. It wasn't until Dr. Yeah, Simon's. Yeah, I fixed it. I fixed uh, it. I see you fixed it finally. All right, so uh, I'm following you guys on Restream. Uh, a lot of interesting stuff going on. I don't know if you saw that Connecticut, I believe, is now opening up uh, businesses and reducing their mask mandate. And let's be very clear, uh, the lack of a mandate doesn't remove the, uh, in, mm, the uh, what shall I use, the uh, propriety of wearing masks. People should continue to wear masks. It's, and a lot of private sector businesses will require it. So I don't think removing a mandate is going to change very much. So we'll see. We'll get to watch the data in real time. Though I'm a little worried that we don't have COVID tracking project after next week or so. So it may be hard to uh, watch it very thoroughly. All right, let's get on with my guest. I've got... Hold on one second. Oh, Susan says no. make sure I have the right things on. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you about my guest. It's Dr. Jonathan Simons. He's a physician scientist, oncologist, a leader in prostate cancer research, and he is now the head of the Prostate Cancer Foundation. Uh, he became the head in 2007. At that point, he was Distinguished Professor of Hematology and Oncology at Emory. 
also a professor of biomedical engineering and material sciences at Georgia Institute of Technology. He's the founding director of the Winship Cancer Institute at Emory and co-director of the National Institute of Cancer Nanotechnology Excellence at Emory and Georgia Tech. Can we bring in Dr. Simons? Yes, you may. Okay, put up with these little details at the bottom. There you are. Jonathan, welcome to the program. Oh, good. It sounds good. So <laughs> I, I think before we get into the uh, sort of the story that uh, we use to attract people to this program, which was the prostate cancer sniffing dogs, before we, we'll hold that out as a tease while we talk about prostate cancer and prostate cancer foundation generally, okay? Uh-oh, he's frozen and not he's hearing okay. me very well. Okay. Do you hear me okay? Okay. So <laughs> let's talk about PCF. Who is who is PCF and why should people care? Ah, uh, hold on a second, Jonathan. They they don't hear him. It says his bandwidth is low. But they there's no sound coming from him at all. His bandwidth is low. No, I understand. That's why it's breaking up a little bit when I listen, but the outside world can't hear anything. Okay. There we go. All right. Try it again. Start from the beginning, Jonathan. Let's do it again. And why, why do and I, I'm a member of the board of the Prostate Cancer Foundation, and what is it that makes us special? Exactly. Uh, I see they're going to, I'm going to do this. So uh, what is it? I, I've always been impressed by the way Prostate Cancer Foundation is able to fund research. Can you tell them about that? The the thing I've been so proud of is the f fact that it feels like the the way we fund the research is one of the most creative offerings I've ever seen in ter in, in medical research. Which is here, do what you want. <laughs> which is I don't I don't know if any does anybody else do anything like that. Right. 
Well, I, to me, I, I want people to head to PCF.org, and if, if you want to contribute to medical research, there's just not a more efficient way to do it. It all goes to the researchers, and it goes to them in such a way that they're unencumbered. They're, they're, literally, it's like, uh, I don't know, I just think of it as, a, as, a, as their creativity and their only their creativity, their intellect, uh, let that guide them, and uh, the, this, the results speak for themselves. Oh, it's been a pleasure, and it's been so much fun to really hear from the, you know, we, we sit through lectures on a regular basis. Not sit through, we are, part, we are able to drop in on lectures on a regular basis and hear the latest research. And it's really, and I've, I've been struck with something that surprised me after becoming a board member was how much the research on prostate cancer was bleeding into understanding of cancer generally. And give them a brief sketch of what some of the more common targets are that are shared amongst cancers that, that we that we have been a part of, particularly. Uh oh, Stop. now hold on a second. Hold on, now I've lost you completely. One second. One second. While well, Susan, can I at least hear him? I have to do something. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Doctor Simons, go ahead. As you were saying. Now he can't hear me. <laughs> Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Dr. Simons? Let's see. Hold on. I'm having problems. People are complaining, and I'm trying to figure out why it's doing what it's doing today. Can you hear us again? Dr. Simons? Okay. So, Let's start up again with the three, the common, let's say the three most common shared targets. So, well, let's, let's describe them a little bit. Let's describe each of them a little bit. So, their cancer is able to evade your immune system, and there are blockers to block the, this one receptor so the T cells can see the cancer again and go kill it. Yeah. No, 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 no. I just, I'm re. I, mm -mm, uh -uh. <laughs> but I'll jump in again. There's a in breast cancer, ovarian cancer, prostate cancer, and pancreatic cancer. Uh, a gene called PARP, P A R P. Uh, there is a spell checker function in our cells to keep us from leaking as our cells divide to replace. So you can actually treat cancers by exploiting the fact that they can't really uh, proofread, they can't spell check their DNA as they divide. So that, that's an area of, uh, of PARP inhibitors where we push the field forward for those cancers and better understanding how to make even better drugs there. And that's coming down the, down the pike pretty quick, too, the, some more PARP inhibitors, yeah.
Isn't that crazy? Can you imagine that? Yeah, it's. I remember when I was in. I remember when I was in training that there was a, you know, they would talk about this sort of thing as some fantasy off in the future, uh, and the way we've gotten here has been so interesting. Just the fact that we can inexpensively and quickly describe the entire genome is just that's crazy. It's so crazy to think that we can do that now. Oh, Susan, he's lost my audio. I know. I, hold on a second. We're having a problem here. No kidding. I know. I beg your pardon. It's not coming through the cable. Hold on a second. I just texted somebody. <laughs> oh my God, what's going on? We had a little, we had some technical difficulties. We got it. I'm going back to. It's very low. And I See, it's not coming through, so I don't know why. Let me try a different thing. Hold on a second. Let me try a different. Can you cross again? I'm going to try a different camera and see if I can. Oh, it's not coming through the cable. The cable's not coming. We had some problems yesterday. We went through this whole thing, and then we... Oh, boy. I beg your pardon. Can you hear us, Dr. Simons? I can. Okay. But it's not coming through the system very well. It's we've got an we've got a link problem. I'm sorry, do. Well, I don't want to waste Dr. Simon's time. I know. I, I, I wonder don't know if what to we do. should uh, reschedule when we're actually functioning <laughs> and able to. Uh, yeah, you okay with that? Well, um, it's just this. I want you on here more thing. than once. Anyway, uh, we should be doing this regularly because this this does reach a lot of people. Uh, and uh, go ahead. And. No, it's not your end. It's not your end. <laughs> yeah. But I, I wish I could blame it on that. Can I try one more thing? Sure. Okay. Go ahead and talk, Dr. S Dr. Simons, can you give give us a test run? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now you count. No, he's, no, he's gone completely. That's gone. That's not that was not good. Oh my gosh, this is so. We've weird. actually never had this problem before. <laughs> no, this it works fine every time. I, I, I would. It's weird. I'm hearing myself back after about five seconds in my headphones. So there's some sort of feedback loop, if that helps you, where I'm hearing it again, very faintly, off in the distance, with like a five second. So alarm. weird. Well, yesterday we had a problem with something else and the audio didn't work on the ads the one interesting things about technical problems is it draws people in they want to be a part of they want to see how we resolve this what's the <laughs> how are they going to get through tell me if that and i'm watching we have a big chat going as we are as we are you and i are talking and no one has left they're all they're all here <laughs> they want to they want to see how this drama ends as do i uh i would like it to end soon <clears throat> There's a second YouTube window open, apparently, according to Wiz Chris, Susan. A second what? YouTube window open. That's what I'm probably hearing back after five seconds. You know what I would love, Dr. Simons, is if what? you would... A reboot? You want to do a reboot the whole thing? Yeah, start a new... All right. See, I'd have to start the whole show over, really, because I I think you have like... to turn the whole computer off and start over. That's what I think. The <laughs> the Zoom was working well the other day. Then we found all these other problems right, and we decision. fixed those. And that? then now this is out. <laughs> let's try that. Let's try that. We have too many bells and whistles. The more I remember my dad would always say, 
too much electronic, too much. Even more, the more electronics, the more potential for trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yep, pretty much right. Pretty much. Hold right. on, I found this thing. Wait, hold on one sec. Cable A zoom. Okay. Let's All try right. that. Okay, Dr. Simon, try talking again. Uh, Drew, you still look cool as a cucumber. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Now, we, now, those of you on the stream, tell me if you heard him say that. Oh, they heard him. Oh, they did? Okay, good. Oh, no, wait a minute. Not. They're all responding to me saying about the electronics. Oh, I think you got it. I think you did okay, it. Okay, try that. Oh, yeah, they're saying yes on multiple platforms. So the Facebook says yes. Twitch says yes. Uh, YouTube says yes. Woo, I got a woo from Facebook Tom Facebook says yes. Okay, now we're good. All right, so Jonathan, we're going <laughs> to... Wow. If you don't mind, let's go quickly back over Okay, let's, those... let's talk about dogs. <laughs> All right, let's talk about dogs. Let's talk about dogs, then, then at the end we'll go back over some of the great... The great um, he needs to talk, though, before we can tell if there's... Oh, well, let's let him talk. Dr. Simons, can you... You're... Well, they said yes. No, they I can, yeah. I, I can hear you really well. I've us? never lost the audio here. Yeah. Everyone's dancing on the restream. So let's talk about uh, prostate cancer sniffing dogs. You should sure. know this is something that Adam Carolla uh, suggested about 20 years ago. He came in one night on the radio and he goes, you know, if dogs can smell it, he was sort of citing all the different things that dogs can do. He goes, well, I bet they get, oh no, they're, at that point they were coming up with STD sniffing dogs. And he goes, if they can sniff STD, why can't they sniff cancer? I bet that has its own unique smell. And we all laughed at him. And now here we are. Right. Well, he was right, uh, at least for prostate cancer. Um, everybody knows that your iPhone can act better than a human eye, and everyone knows it can act better than a human ear. But we know the technology is well developed that you could biosense gases on your iPhone as well. In fact, there was a, there was a lot of work after 9-11 on the development of an artificial dog's nose, so you didn't need dogs uh, to, do, to do bomb sniffing, but you needed to use dogs or learn from dogs what to sniff in a machine. Mm -hmm. And am I, is the audio okay? Yeah, it's all good. Okay, great. So we set out, given some anecdotal reports that dogs can smell cancers, to prove that that wasn't true in prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. But if it was true in prostate cancer, we would be interested in building a, a um, like a tricorder in Star Trek, a biosensor for prostate cancer, because we still want to catch prostate cancer 10 or even 15 years earlier if we could. And we want to find the most aggressive kind. Um, and because dogs are uh, 50 times, they have dogs have 300 million sensors in their brain. Uh, we only have five million, so they're, they would be much better sommeliers if they could talk. They, <laughs> they, um, a dog. I don't know. You should see where my dog puts his nose. I, I just, no, that's, but that, that, no, but they're sensing their environment. So I, that's that's the Homo sapien bias. I, anyway, I get it. Listen, maybe it may smell like lilacs to him, but it's still it's right. still rather ast astonishing yeah. what he uh, enjoys. Anyway, the um, Claire Guest, Dr. Claire Guest in Britain, um, has a laboratory with disease that trains basically using bomb, bomb sniffing techniques, uh, dogs to detect diseases. Mm -hmm. it's, and so skin we, cancer was an early and easier sort of putt, right? Right. Uh, skin cancer, um, exactly. Um, so we, with it, with researchers at uh, MIT and at Johns Hopkins, we act, and two re dog researchers. So to our knowledge, this is the first um, dual species cancer research, which was double randomized, double blinded uh, trial. The dogs actually could be trained to smell the most aggressive form of prostate cancer in urine. And then um, samples from Johns Hopkins were shipped to Britain and the, the dogs could indeed um, detect that there was cancer in the urine and then we went on to look at well what what are the chemicals that the dogs like like how an explosive is detected in them something called a mass spectrometer like what are the gases um and now we're very interested so absolutely dogs can smell prostate cancer um and uh is it a particular breed of dog that's able to do it or no, they're, I, no, they're like Olympic athletes of do of basically of um, of smell of smell. Mm -hmm. So they can be spaniels, they can be gun dogs, 
Um, they can be Labradors, but they do have long snouts. That's true. Kind of like in basketball, it's hard to find a five foot two uh, shooting guard anymore. Um, <laughs> but fundamentally, they're very bright and they are working dogs. They're all working dogs, Drew. They yeah. like to do this. They, right. Um, and that's that's the thing that uh, well I heard that when they when they go to look for these dogs they go to the pound and they look for the most enthusiastic dogs the most responsive not the right. and and I'm sure they have some sort of bias in terms of what their nose looks like or you know what they're what's likely to be an eff effective uh, breed but it isn't it isn't just the breed by any means no no but they they most about ninety eight percent wash out because uh, they're not accurate enough just like in with bomb sniffing. But um, with that methodology, you can train these dogs um, basically rather than smell um, for explosives like C4 or cocaine. Um, you can train them to smell malaria. You can, and now you can train them to smell prostate cancer. And our, our goal was is that now that there clearly is a gaseous, there's a unique scent or set, of, they're called volatile organic compounds, basically gases like. When you spill gasoline at the filling station, you smell the gasoline. That's a volatile organic compound. Mm. So we we we're interested now in building our, an artificial dog's nose for doctors' offices, and mm. um, that 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 could pick up the smell of cancer even before the PSA test. Very interesting. And do you think this is something that's going to be widely used? Well, I think it could be. Um, we need to get to the bottom of exactly what are the dogs smelling. Uh, but in the same way, uh, in the same way with artificial intelligence now, you can look through patterns of things in whole new ways. We think that the patterns, sort of the patterns of these gases really could be a diagnostic test. And we would like to find uh, prostate cancer five years earlier than we currently find it in the most aggressive, at least in eight, Clayson, in, in the most aggressive uh, cancers, if there was a urine test that a man had once a year, uh, when they were giving their urinalysis, we think it could add an enormous amount. Um, and it t discuss with people, talk to them a little bit about the Gleason score. To just give a little overview on prostate cancer, because I, I think that's important uh, for people to understand. This is a very common cancer. I don't think they heard it when you said it before, because your volume was so low. Right. So let's let's start do, over that. Let's whole just thing. do another little <laughs> survey of the of the scene of the you know, situation with prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is the second most common cancer in men. It, it's as breast cancer is to women, prostate cancer is to men. Prostate cancer, if caught early, is 99% curable. Uh, we've reduced the deaths from prostate cancer in the United States with research by 53%, but we still have a man dying from prostate cancer about every 24 minutes around the clock, hmm. 365 days a year. So it's still a, a very important cancer to eliminate. So if we could catch prostate cancers years earlier, and uh, and inexpensively, as a part of just men's health, it would be a huge step forward. And it turns out, because the prostate's connected to the urinary system, of course, uh, it turns out dogs can smell the gases that are made by prostate cancer. That's crazy. Dogs can smell uh, basically uh, dynamite or, an, or or C4 explosive, hmm. and they can smell. The ability of a dog, it's almost unbelievable, uh, but this is mathematically accurate. The ability of a dog to take, pick up a scent is so refined in their brains that a way to think of it is if you know where's Waldo, <laughs> if you had 18 planets Earth, the dynamic range of a dog to, to pick up a scent or like one molecule um, in a bunch of just air is that it would be like picking you out, Drew, in 18 planets of Earth of the entire world's population. So their, their evolution just made the dog's nose an incredible sensor wow. um, if they're trained, you know, if they're trained. So we, we feel that it will be possible to build a, a sensor uh, that sniffs off of a thing like an iPhone for doctors that could pick up that one molecule from a bad can from a bad prostate cancer in a sea of other molecules. Hmm. Um, 
But the, the trick is going to be now that we've proven, we tried to prove that the dogs couldn't do it and they very definitely can do it with great accuracy. The trick's going to be the research of identifying what are those molecules exactly, because we want to build a, a, basically an artificial nose that only is sniffing for cancer. And, um, you know, there's a whole program. You can, the dogs can detect COVID and COVID infections. We don't quite understand how, um, how they do it, but they're the closest thing I've told scientific colleagues um, is they like to do it, number one. I mean, they like, if you train them, they, it's, like, it's like joyful work, and that's in the breed. The second thing is they're careful. They would rather not call it yes if they're unsure. Hmm. So they're, 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 they're built in cautious. So when they sit down, that's how they signal. They, they go from standing to sitting. They won't move. They've just smelled it. They've smelled, what, they've smelled the target odor, and it's called um, so we, we have a, we have more research to do, but yeah, it, um, it's all very feasible and with artificial intelligence, and this is important, it's probably, they're smelling like a bunch of notes, like in, you know, like in wine. Um, and we think the dogs, we, we think the dogs can teach us enough about the notes that they smell by taking the individual, uh, gas molecules and giving them back to the dog to smell that they could teach us enough that we could build such an artificial dog's nose. Let, let's talk a little bit about, about Gleason scores and prostate cancer and, sure. you know, the different illnesses that make up prostate cancer, essentially. I always think of it as different illnesses because it it's and, behaves so differently. Yeah. There, um, there are at least, well, 20 kinds of prostate cancer under the heading prostate cancer, you know, there are 11 kinds of breast cancer and we treat breast cancer differently uh, depending on what kind of patient has. But prostate cancer, Gleason score is kind of like the, uh, how, how fast is the cancer growing? So there are cancers that are going at 90 miles an hour um, that we worry a lot about in terms of um, spreading and metastasizing in their prostate cancers that are going five miles an hour and are like warts. They'll never cause a patient pro a problem in their lifetimes. And those are um, Gleason six, or they have a different grade. And what we want to do with uh, what we want to do with uh, uh, the dog data, or basically biosensing urine, is find the hundred mile an hour cancers five years earlier, even before the PSA test. And the PSA is a, test is a very good test for prostate diseases, but the PSA test doesn't tell us how many miles per hour, how fast the cancer is growing. So that, that would be the difference here. Right. And, and, the, and the PSA can – now let's talk about the controversies around PSA because a lot of people go, my doctor says I shouldn't be getting a PSA or shouldn't get it so often. And there's, and there's a divide historically between urology and general medicine on the utility of PSA relative – to um, causing untoward morbidity and mortality by results by results that maybe were uh, premature. Yeah, the the PSA test um, overdiagnoses prostate cancers and saves men's lives with aggressive prostate cancer. It does both those things. And what did I just say? Well, there's a kind of prostate cancer we wish we never found because it will never cause a patient problems in their lifetime. And then there are these cancers that we want to find. But but we don't really know. We don't know the ones that aren't going to cause problem, right? So we have, no. so that's we have where, to find them all and then treat, and then treat men correctly. Right. Based and, on um, what's found at biopsy and not over treat men. So that's the PSA controversy. In the right. Shell. Right. And I and I think haven't we, hasn't it been somewhat settled now that we that the current recommendations from urology are sound, that and yes. essentially every man every year after fifty, unless you have a first degree relative, then it's after forty. That's yeah. Everyone now agrees on that. Yeah. Uh, what to do with for, it gets more complicated. Yeah, exactly. And actually, we have for patients a uh, patient guide at at PCF.org that really takes patients through the the options and one option for men who have prostate cancer going two miles an hour is 
active surveillance is not to have surgery, not to have radiation, uh, but to actually um, uh, improve their diet or alter their diet. But yeah, prostate cancer is um, um, has on the one hand the uh, benefit of the PSA test and has also um, suffered in a way because the PSA test isn't specific just to it's, it's to prostate cancer alone or what kind of prostate cancer. And that's why the dogs uh, basically detecting uh, volatile organic compounds, basically gases from cancer in urine um, could be a big step forward. And because the gases the dogs are picking up are the 100 mile an hour cancer. And how about wow. the cancers that don't produce PSA? We don't know. That's a great question. That's a that is a future research question for the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> because because th there are some bad cancers that don't produce PSA. Yeah, yeah, and we're curious if the dogs can pick that out too. Yeah, and the, the, the fact is that the, the, you're at the forefront of our knowledge now. Right on this. Right, and and I, and I, you you said something that that you went past pretty quickly, and I want to make sure people don't put too much on that. That we can by adjusting our diet change the growth of prostate cancer. Well, actually, uh, we're doing a lot. There was a very important study at MD Anderson on the Mediterranean diet because yeah. of COVID. Hmm. A lot of these findings are just obscured, right? Because the news cycle doesn't have. I didn't have bandwidth or something earlier, but the news cycle. <laughs> Um, hasn't really covered a lot of developments. Yeah. But in fact, in February, a team at MD Anderson Science we funded showed that for men with the slower growing prostate cancer who stay on a Mediterranean diet, um, um, about a third of them, their cancer wouldn't progress. Like it's put in suspended animation. Well, uh, that to me, way. let me let me push back on that science a little bit because I have questions. Um, when I first had my prostate cancer diagnosed, first thing that um, Skip Holden said to me was, "30 percent stay the same, 30 percent get better, 30 percent get worse." So the Mediterranean diet, 30 percent, same as without the Mediterranean diet. No, it's a neck and it's additional 30 percent. So but it's these are, but these are Gleason. Sorry, but these are. 10 to 15 mile per hour. So Gleason, not, not, not Gleason sevens and eights. So Gleason um, six, I should be very clear about that. Yeah. Well, no, that's what he told me too. He said in, in four to six, he, in, in the ones he picks up that are under seven, this was his rule of thumb, 30, 30, 30. But you're yeah. saying, you're saying it's more like 50% uh, improve if you take yeah. the, uh, yeah. And, okay. and actually the, um, I sound definitely like I, I've spent a lot of time in California. I've been talking about dogs and now the Mediterranean diet. <laughs> but, but underneath, underneath the dogs are volatile organic compounds from, from, uh, you know, from the fundamental biochemistry of bad cancers. And on the other hand, what I'm saying is that diet, prostate cancer. Um, there, I just reviewed this the other day. Prostate, there are over 90 high quality research papers. Some prostate cancers are clearly influenced by whether you are uh, influenced in terms of their growth by whether or not a patient is on an anti-inflammatory or a very heart healthy diet versus not. Hmm. And we're, we think we have some clues as to why that is the case. Um, it's a bit of a digression, but we're very interested in, in terms of precision and knowing which patients diet won't make any difference and in which patients diet could make a huge difference. And we should be prescribing really a precision diet. Well, it, it, it sounds like, bad. it sounds like it's much like COVID people with an ongoing inflammatory state from what we used to call metabolic syndrome, central obesity, you know, the obese, this is the <laughs> inflammatory organ. Uh, and it sounds like it has, more effects than just whether or not you get a cytokine storm. There's no question that that's true in prostate and in, in, in a significant amount of prostate cancer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then Africans, uh, 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 Americans of African descent of, and it's all types of Af all regions of Africa, right? Have an increased risk of more serious prostate cancer at the time of presentation. Yeah. Uh, one in six men of African descent get prostate cancer. One in nine of European Sent. Unless it's Norway, so it's unless almost, it's Nor unless you're from Norway, uh, right? We, yeah, 
Yeah, isn't, the isn't Scandinavian. The, if you're a Scandinavian European, you have a higher risk. Too. Yeah, it's like one in f five or something. It's crazy, That's right? It's high. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so African descent, but the, but the problem with African descent is not just that you have high incidence of prostate cancer. It's much higher grade at the time of diagnosis and much more serious uh, prostate cancer. Would that be accurate? Uh, yeah, twice as many men of African descent die of prostate cancer if they get it than uh, mm, it's men awful. of European descent. And, and is that uh, health care disparities or is that a, a genetic issue? Or can both. we not tell yet? Yeah, both. They don't have it no, checked? Well, yeah, the... Um, very clearly, there is a real genetic component, uh, which helps explain why twice as wh wh why seventy nine percent more African American men get prostate cancer. And actually, we have a pretty good set of clues as to what genes are running in families. Of, um, and also, it's 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 lifestyle. It's clearly also um, the uh, uh, so access to healthcare and. Mm -hmm. We think Diets. their gene environment interactions, maybe in a man between their sort of 15 and 30, mm. um, the kinds of calories you get, um, literally gene gene diet interactions may have a huge, huge effect as well. But Some, that, that remains to be proven. Somebody asked a basic question, why is prostate cancer so common? I'm not sure that's a question we can really answer, can we? It's, I, I guess. Well, I guess it, like, how does it compare to breast cancer? I mean, it's more common. The numbers are very similar. Yeah, it it it, it uh, and which is why it's sort of sad that prostate cancer doesn't sit at the head of the table with breast cancer, which is sort of silly. But I I'm going to say the reason that there's so much prostate cancer is essentially all men will develop prostate cancer if they live long enough. That's sort of an axiom. Would that be an accurate axiom? Yeah. The yeah. Essentially, all men will develop prostate. So it's, 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 there's something about the nature of those cells in the prostate that they are prone to genetic DNA replication errors. It's not a, it's not a highly replicating, uh, it's, it's not turning over a lot, is it? Like, like colon? No, it, the right. prostate doesn't uh, turn over double replace itself like your col your colon i think replaces itself three times a year right so usually it sells it, uh, this is more like pancreas i guess pancreas really isn't replacing itself very often right and right. yet pancreas cancer is kind of common and i would say what i would i in my mind i equate pancreas and prostate but prostate has this special problem of the androgen receptor and I think the androgen receptor is what accelerates the issue. Can, am, I, am I onto something? And can you speak to that? You are. Yeah. So speak yeah, to well, that. And not that you think about this all the time, but uh, we have about 300 different kinds of stem cells because what makes the back of your retina is different than what makes your skin, which makes your colon, makes your prostate, makes the breast tissue for, uh, for milk, for lactation. So the stem cells that make us us uh, – have different software pre programs running. We all they all have the same genes, but they run off of different software. And there's something about the prostate stem cell um, software that um, requires the the androgen requires testosterone. So, and, and so it, it's very responsive to the testosterone, and the 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 biochemistry of the androgen receptor figures prominently in the cancer and the cancer treatment. Right. Prostate stem cells, prostate cancer stem cells use the androgen receptor kind of like a gas tank to, for basically to um, supply the energy that does not quite right. But it's a, it's a the androgen receptor um, is a major signal for making a prostate cell want to divide, to divide. And so the old the old approach was to just get rid of testosterone, but now we have all these fancy. I, is, am I right in saying enzalutamide and those medicines are, are newer? Tell them about these medicines, and I believe PCF was it was instrumental in bringing them around. Yeah, no, this whole class of drugs are are PCF drugs. Well, the you can stop a prostate cancer cell from uh, dividing if if you block the androgen receptor the testosterone signal to the androgen receptor to the dna or another you can unplug it's kind of like unplugging um, a, a, a desk lamp you can make new medicines that rather than uh, pull the plug out um, 
uh, go up and just turn the switch off. So it's a switch off. These are new switch off medicines right. uh, that you mentioned. Yeah. And people are asking about the digital rectal exam. That has, that has sort of backed off in importance in terms of screening. Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah. Most cancers, uh, most cancers, you can't feel that you wanted to find. So right. a digital rectal exam. But a digital rectal exam can be sometimes helpful um, with the rare cancers that are pushing out in a peculiar way. So it's it's a valuable test, but it's not a great screening test. Yeah. By the time by the time you've got your PSA at a concerning level, you're getting an ultrasound anyway, right? Yeah, Wouldn't that that's show you right. the, it would show you the same thing, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's it's when kind we were, of go ahead. Like when we, yeah the um, it's funny because. I've been, we've been using the tricorder out of, from Star Trek is kind of this idea that you would have machines in the future that would sense all kinds of things to help make a diagnosis. The brrr, for a patient. Brrr, 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 brrr. The, bones, exactly. bones, little scanning device. The digital, the digital rectal exam is from two centuries ago Yeah. in terms of, uh, but it is a scent. It can sense in the hands of somebody who knows how to do it firmly, gently, correctly. You're right. It can, it can help us sometimes understand if, if, the position if, of a cancer. If you see a urologist, you'll get a digital rectal exam. But your internist, your family practitioner may not. You can get around that. Get your damn PSA. Don't 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 tell yourself I don't have any problems like that. Don't that's a blood test, like right? It's a blood test. That's a, that's a <laughs> Somebody asked. Blood. It's a blood test. Uh, let's <laughs> let's go back over the the three areas of uh, importance that we were discussing that people couldn't hear earlier. The um, you know, the uh, checkpoint inhibitors and the PARP inhibitors and that kind of stuff. Uh, so people can understand what, where cancer research is right now. So uh, <coughs> cancers kill people because uh, genes are mutated and the software changes and a cell uh, starts dividing and spreads throughout your body that's not supposed to leave where it is. That's how cancer works. And we've made medicines against these genes now by knowing what the genes do. L literally, um, those are called precision medicines. And they're not, they're not poisons for rapidly growing cells. They're specific medicines. They're precision medicines for uh, genes that are abnormal. So in prostate cancer, we know that there are genes that, like the PARP genes that drive breast cancer ovarian cancer so, pancreatic so, so, cancer so parp cancer. parp the you when you're, you the process the the process whereby cells divide is a freaking miracle the fact that these gigantic shreds of dna open and uncoil and get replicated and the the so-called spelling of the dna gets replicated it's just a phenomenal process but in the process of the replication there can be a mistake and there's there is proteins that come by and literally spell check there's checking the spelling and that's what PARP's all about. Right. So these are specific drugs. And you have to know the gene. You have to know that the gene is mutant. So there's a test that goes with every drug, unlike the 20th century, where we didn't have a test to know if chemotherapy would work or not. Um, we only had our experience with these drugs in the laboratory or in patients. So uh, examples of precision drugs are... Uh, PARP inhibitors, uh, T cell activating drugs, um, the anti CTLA drugs. So, so again, I, I just want to frame it for people. So, the one you know, one of the things that cancer researchers do, they look at what is what's with these cells. How are they able to do this? And one of the things they have to do, they have to be able to grow blood vessels. How do they do that? Well, now there's angiogenesis blockers, which I noticed have really not been a big deal in prostate cancer. Is that accurate? Yeah, no, they're not. The current ones are not active in prostate cancer, but Weird. they're very important in yeah. ovarian cancer. Oh, sure. And that, but, has to do, that has to do with the difference in the genes that are mutant. Interesting. And, and, and so you have to build blood vessels, and you have to evade the immune system. And that's what that's what uh, Dr. Simon is talking about now, is how it gets past the immune system and how you can unlock that ability for the immune system to see it again. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Do you do a much better job at this than I do. No, I'm just used to doing this. I, I, but listen, you have to prompt me because I won't do it spontaneously. I have to be, oh yeah, that's what that is. And then uh, the wind, wind inhibitors. Or wind, yeah, the, and yeah. we have a lot, big research effort now uh, in blocking something called WNT or WNT, 
which we currently don't have medicines for, but are really important in breast cancer, 60% breast cancer, about 30% of prostate cancer, the wind pathway, 100% basically of chemotherapy resistant colon cancer. So uh, if we develop a drug for prostate cancer against wind, we make chemotherapy incurable, colon cancer potentially curable. So the idea is uh, a, uh, our projects are not just for prostate cancer, they're for the genes that drive prostate cancer and, and 73 other forms of human cancer. Right, and, and again, a please. A dollar for us is not just a dollar for prostate cancer research. And these, a project with us for prostate cancer now has implication for other, really, other fine forms of human cancer. It's, it's, I've seen it happen in real time, it's really rather extraordinary. And you know, prostate cancer, when I was in training again, was a, Urology generally was a very sleepy discipline as it pertained to oncology. <laughs> Prostate cancer was you either had this aggressive form that you died of, or we kind of watched it and whatever. We took the prostate out sometimes, but we didn't want to do that because we didn't have any good ways of doing it. Or we'd uh, shut off your test testes and, uh, and kind of watch it. It was very, it was very um, primitive, I would say, <laughs> when I was in training. And all of a sudden, it really is with the PCF, uh, when uh, Michael Milken founded the PCF, that it, that the it became a sexy field, and started leading cancer research, which was really a, quite a turnaround. Yeah, uh, historic turnaround. Yeah, that's I, I I would never have predicted that, or you know, in 1985. Now, uh, riddle me this: um, seemed like last time I was sitting in lectures, I hadn't thought of this in a while, but uh, there was a lot of excitement about the thymidine kinase pathway. A lot of stuff going on there. Was there not? Am I wrong about that? No. And, and, um, but, it and that disappeared. <laughs> Where'd that go? Um, because a lot of the cancers where we were hopeful in the laboratory just didn't pan out in uh, patients. I see. And um, there have been th some of the targets like PARP are much more exciting. Um, the drugs, the early generation of drugs are far more effective so 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 i'm right thymine kinase sort of just dropped off the radar okay because i was it's yeah. funny when those things go away you don't notice they're gone because you're busy with your attention at the you know the PARP inhibitors all this other stuff and and i remember PARP inhibitors were coming in as there was a lot of stuff around thy thymine kinase and i and it made sense to me biologically that that would be a fertile i let me put it this way it made sense to me biologically. I hope we direct our attention back there again. Maybe we just didn't have the right, hit, weren't hitting the right spots. Maybe. Because I, I just, that all made such sense to me. that, and, and it's also made sense to me they could influence other cancers equally dramatically, potentially. Um, so, so the dogs, the PSA, the exciting treatments that are out there, the fact that PCF.org, you can find information about what we're doing and the research. And and I, and I just want to say it again. I said it at the beginning before we could hear Dr. Simons was that the, I, I feel like we're funding, sorry. Like what's well, all right. You, you, you correct it. It's great. I feel like we're funding. I don't know how else to say this, but like artists and telling them to go, go create. And they, and they also happen to be these brilliant scientists and, and brilliant uh, laboratory uh, professionals that really understand how to, how to run a lab. And they come back with extraordinary things when you allow them to create freely. That's, that's, that's very true. And, and I just don't think other, I just, you know, if you get, let's put it this way, for people who don't understand this, if you got money from a school or a government, there would be a million bureaucratic, administrative uh, requirements and restrictions. And am, am I overdoing it? Am I not right on that? No, you're right. Yeah. So the, and that and that makes it hard for people to do their research. It's it's very much. Well, I it, here's a topic. I don't know if you're prepared to talk about just very quickly, but um, I'm surprised what has happened to our profession during the COVID outbreak. I I feel like our we we I don't know what's happened where people aren't using their judgment. They're not. They're afraid to improvise. They're afraid. They're afraid to talk with one another about the science of what they're seeing. Have you seen the same thing I'm seeing? No, I really haven't. But the cancer community, I think, has been so open with uh, actually partly through Twitter, through social media in a new way. I, I've seen enormous amount of innovative idea sharing. But I've, I've only been, and I've been very busy, as you know, 
I've only been interested in my patients and, uh, you know, uh, and everybody in oncology basically had, has had to become somewhat of a COVID specialist. So I haven't really, I can't speak to the entire rest of the medical profession. What are you excited about going forward? Other than dog sniffing, <laughs> dog sniffing for prostate cancer. I mean, my, yeah, I actually, it's really, I'm excited about finding bad prostate cancer, killer prostate cancers five years earlier than the yeah. blood test. That's important. The, the thing I'm most excited about I'm, this year, I think, is the our ability to make some more of these amazing uh, precision medicines um, that are very, very specific, that are better than chemo. Um, but um, more effective than chemo that would uh, be used not just in prostate cancer, but in other very aggressive cancers. So precision Is oncology. Anything, anything specific you have in mind when you say that? Oh, we're very excited about WINT inhibitors. Mm. In lung cancer, there's a RAS inhibitor for the first time. It's kind of amazing. Uh, RAS isn't a gene in our team. The um, hidden in plain sight, Drew, is just enormous medical research progress right now. It just is. It's just happening it's so fast. Fun. Yeah, it's yeah. happening so fast. And again, a lot of it because of the advances technologically, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the one thing I was excited about as a clinician, and I just haven't heard much about it lately, is uh, radio labeled, uh, you know, f focused ex radiation therapies, you know, right into the cell. Uh, you, you very kindly had us, probably 18 months ago, we heard a couple lectures on that. And I've never really heard much since. Occasionally I hear Dr. Um, Holden talk about it. Where, where is all that? Uh, it'll be in front of the FDA, uh, we think, in, uh, in under 12 months. That's Precision Radio Pharmaceuticals. Yes. Because that, um, cause that I, you know, the, I, I still have in my mind seeing these diffuse metastatic uh, bone scans that completely remit. I mean, that's like, that's a, as a clinician, that's like, wow, that is a striking thing to see. Even if there is a recurrence afterwards, just to be able to do that, un, un, that's an uncanny advance. Yeah, the, um, we're, we're blinded at, right now as to the results of the large, um, I think most Americans know now that about large phase three, large clinical trials, but um, we're very hopeful that um, there's a, the findings in smaller numbers of patients are borne out. And then that would be another new class of anti-cancer drugs. I, I, I don't specific. And, and again, patients don't throw up, they don't lose their hair. I, I can't um, imagine that's not, I, very, I just, really remarkable. just based on what you showed us, I can't imagine that's not going to be a major option. Exactly what it means as an option, I guess we'll know from these phase three trials, but I, I can't imagine it won't be a great, a great option. So when you were at Emory, uh, I got a couple questions. Steve, are you not from the South, are you? You're from New England, right? Or Middle Atlantic? Uh, uh, upstate New York, Ithaca, New York. Ithaca. And, and did you go to school up there too? No. Uh, I, I went to school. I went to college at Princeton and then stayed in the Middle Atlantic and went to Hopkins for medical school. Okay, that's, that's the Mid-Atlantic thing I've got in my head. All right. And how did you end up at the PCF? Uh, I was among the first young scientists funded in the first year, uh, just starting my laboratory. And then, uh, I guess, uh, 16 years later, Michael Milk and the chairman and founder um, called and said, you've been training your whole life for this assignment, <laughs> which could you run the foundation. And uh, my whole life has been about trying to end with research, uh, prostate cancer deaths. So it's, it's the most impactful job I could think of. It. Um, so it's been a real privilege to be the CEO and president. So, so it, I didn't know whether with prostate cancer was your primary focus when you were down at Emory. Uh, well, no, I started the cancer center there, but I had a pretty vigorous laboratory uh, effort working on prostate cancer and why, why prostate cancer hides from the immune system. And were you practicing oncology at any time? Uh, the, all, the whole time. The, the, I haven't stopped practicing oncology since 1998, but I don't have a large practice. I, I mean, I, I just, and now it's really just, but just prostate cancer now, right? Or am I wrong? Right. Yeah. But right. I guess so I, 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 I did general medical oncology at Emory. That, that's my question. That was my yeah. question. Yeah. 
And, um, you know, it's funny, uh, again, just I, I sort of see the, the sweep of history um, before me, and I keep thinking about what it was like when I was in training. And at that point in, you know, very early 80s, you had to be, you had to like shake your head if somebody went into oncology. It's like, oh, why would you do that? It's like so depressing. It's like nothing you can do. What, I mean, what, why do you do a practice oncology? I think if I were starting again now, I'd go into oncology. It's so exciting. It's so it, exciting what's happening. It really is. And the medical students now, um, with my limited scientific survey, the is, medical students feel that way. Mm. In fact, this generation in medical school thinks all cancer is conquerable. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. And and their life experience has shown them that that can be true. So different, I, you know, than, than where we were at. It, it was just, uh, yeah. do you know, do throw some poisons, to pray, and see what happens. And, and usually not a lot of good things did. It, it was very depressing. But I guess it really is because of those uh, – those folks that soldiered on that we got the advances we got. Yeah. We've, our field has been built on the shoulders of lots of men and women who've been doing the dedicated hard work. Yep. But genomics, the ability to read DNA, the ability to use CRISPR to make new kinds of drugs. It's this decade is going to end up being the most extraordinary in the history of medical research for cancer cures and cancer prevention. What, what is that, uh, uh, that principle or law of how technology grows, Morris's law or Moore's something. Law. What is it? Moore's law. Moore's law. I said Morris's law. Moore's law. Moore's I, I think we have the same thing in biological technology now, don't you? We do. Yeah, we it, do. It, it seems like the same things happening, and and that's going to be the big the, and you know in a way much like we're all you know all these incredible advances were built off some basic platforms in technology right there's just a few platforms out there everything else exploded off of in a way same things happening in biotech we have a few br um, extraordinary technologies that are our basic platforms and everything's sort of flowing out of that you're right interesting well listen uh i'm <laughs> sorry I'll let you go. I'm sorry for the technical problems at the beginning, but I think this was an important conversation. Uh, I know it's so strange. I'm I have Alan, that that like 20 year old cute guy who works for Carlos. He's coming over later to find out <laughs> why I'm having all these problems all the time. <laughs> We're gonna get it's a real the strangest thing. It's like somebody came in and turned all the knobs at one time, and somebody on Twitch said that. It's happening to a lot of the gamers and stuff, so I don't feel so bad. So, so, all right, well. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I, I, but at least we can see, hear you. We got all some great messaging, and um, Thank you. I wanted I want to also tell people to go to uh, pcf.org/donate if you want to make a donation to the Prostate Cancer uh, Foundation. I'm just throwing that out there because no, no that's amount, what I do. No amount is too small. Literally, a ten dollar donation. They didn't ask me up. to do this, but I just like to do that. Yeah, well, so. it 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 adds up, and it. it it's just it's if you're interested in helping uh, medical research, this is extraordinarily efficient use of your money. I, yes, I promise. Yes. I promise. We only we only the, some of the other ones. There's a lot of other ones out there doing cancer, and they have lots of infrastructure and do lots of other things with their money. And not that they're bad; they're good, and I support them. But it's not as effect not as efficient in terms of the dollars you give. Am I speaking out of turn, Doctor Simons? Uh, I really we really appreciate your. Uh, enthusiastic support. I'm surprised I remembered that. <laughs> uh, good. Uh, and again, I've been with them for a while and I've seen them grow and it's just been extraordinary. And uh, they, they, I hope at very minimum you learned a couple things today, everybody, that uh, after 40, if you have a first degree relative with prostate cancer, after 50 for everybody else, PSA every year, everyone, mm -hmm. and that we don't worry any longer about diagnosing it too early because we do something called active surveillance to see sort of which category you fit into if you're one of the slower growing tumors. And there's lots of good treatments, surgical, x-ray, th uh, radiation therapy, uh, precision oncology is alive and well. And you should be very optimistic should you get a diagnosis. Uh, and it should, you should anticipate getting it early if we do these things properly. For your, my African-American friends, please get your PSA. It, it's The numbers there, we must improve. 
we just have to get that better um and it's you know up to all of us and if you have i noticed that my um black female friends are the ones that get their males into the doctor which is true for all middle-aged men anyway it's just it's our wives and daughters that get us into the doctor so please if you have a male in your life uh, get him on in to get properly screened like i did with drew and that's how i was di- that's how i was diagnosed that's exactly right he was sick all the time and he got h1n1 and i said you're sick too much Something's you need wrong. to go to the doctor she said, so. Something is wrong, and I was like, oh. "I was a, I was a sniffing dog." I, I do, knew. Do you know exactly. my story, Jonathan? Do you know my story? I do. Yeah, because because they. Yeah, you're right. The. Oh, but it went. Of us are often the best advocates for men's health, and they're often <laughs> not men. Well, but I, I, my thing was so I go in. My PSA had gone from one to four, and I said, "Great, I'll see you in six months. We'll check it again." And my general general service went, ah, "I don't know. I don't feel comfortable letting you go. Go see a urologist." Okay, I'll see urologist. Urologist goes, yeah, you're probably here way too early. Let's repeat it after antibiotics and anti-inflammatories, probably prostatosis, prostatitis. Doesn't go down. Well, let's do it again. You still, let's do another two weeks of antibiotics and anti-inflammatories. Still doesn't go down. You need a biopsy. And my response was, are you kidding me? You see everybody? It's because you're you're nervous, you're anxious, <laughs> you're over-treating me. I told you I'll come back in six months, and now I'm going to get a, bi- a biopsy of my prostate. I'm so pissed. <laughs> Boom, prostate cancer. So, um, so the reality was everybody had good judgment all the way along, including Susan. Except for you. Yeah, because I was a patient. You can't <laughs> judge about yourself. That's why you have to have a do- somebody else. He didn't have a doctor doing the judgment. I had I had just gotten a doctor, and I never get sick. But I signed up for with this great doctor in town, and I was like, you know, I'm just getting one just because I'm old. And um, I said, go get a doctor. And he's like, well, no, I got this guy over here. Yeah, I had, and I I had because I just recovered from H1N1. I had an infectious disease colleague. I had a cardiologist watching my blood pressure. I had a pulmonologist because I had pneumonia. Like, what do I need an internist for? I'm, he was I treating internist. himself. I wasn't treating Dr. myself. Simons. I was going to subspecialist. No, and I, he was treating himself. All right, anyway. He was. So I was. I, I saw lesson it. Lesson learned. Jonathan like every Simons. month he'd come and go, I just had food poisoning. I don't feel well. I have a cold. And it was like six months every month he'd get sick. And I was like, that's not normal. Like you you shouldn't feel crappy all the time. Probably probably had nothing to do with the prostate cancer. But I'm I think your ex- immune system was all whacked out. I'm still glad you were paying attention. So wait, I have a question. If you have cancer and you don't know it, can can your immune system just be really bad? And then you, you know, you don't really think it's cancer, but can it cause your immune system to be bad? So hang on. So there, there's actually kind of a complicated question. I know. I'm sorry. So, so he probably wants to go. And by immune system, what do you mean? Like you, why did you get sick and right, think so, it was food poisoning and you so, were throwing so, up all night? So and- does having a tumor that your body is responding to of any, let's just pick any type of tumor. I want him to answer. Change your immunological homeostasis. I can. Can, and, yeah. And the other thing is true. If you have a diminished immune system, you can be uh, more cancer prone, prone, right? Which is probably but most, most. But most people that get cancer, um, it's not the immune system that it, the immune system got tricked. But it wasn't because their immune system was deficient, right? So, so the the, the PARP inhibitor is one protection against genetic errors. The other is your immune system to come kill those cells that don't look right. right. Yeah. Right. So my instincts are right. I'm not a doctor. Far from it. <laughs> Tell her she's right, Dr. Simons. It's really been nice to be with you. <laughs> <laughs> and, thank, and, and thanks for all the um, uh, health information you provide uh, to uh, so many people. Thank you. We're working on it. And uh, <laughs> we appreciate you coming in today. It's an interesting story about the dogs. I, I, I knew that would be something kind of fascinating, and people are indeed fascinated by it. Uh, we, Will, I mean, I didn't ask this. Let me just ask it about the dogs. Are there going to be dogs running around doing this until you find the robot? <laughs> no, no, we want to build the robotic nose, but we need like the we airport need more dogs. Yeah, we need the dogs to teach us what are they smelling. But we're and not going to. You're not going to actually right. adopt dogs to go run around urology offices. No. no. Okay. Look how cute no, they no. are. Susan. No. Susan wanted that in her future. She wanted to see dogs like this on the screen running around. But they around. they sniff the urine. They test the urine, yes. right? Yeah. So so it would help for breast cancer or other kinds of cancers as well. well there's well? some evidence that they can do this for breast cancer. The, the but um, the, uh, they can do this for COVID. Um, they can do this for malaria. They can Christ. smell the breath. But um, 
That's wild. I imagine but black- each one of these projects, which each one of these projects just needs a lot of R and D, yeah. and that that that's what the story is: is that um, because the prostate um, sits there in the urinary stream, it, it might be possible to make a very inexpensive and yeah. very precise test for the that most makes more aggressive sense. prostate cancer. I'm, I'm sure, sure. Bladder cancer also. Yeah. No. Yes. Uh, bladder yep. cancer is another project. Yep. Yep. And. Mm-hmm. and uh, Interesting. Anything that comes out of your urine. Well, it's just in, it, it's saturated with it. You know, the urine is sitting in it. So. Fascinating. Yeah, it does. Fascinating. Thank you so much. Really, really. God great bless. Keep right. up the good work. Dr. Simons, you can Thanks find so out more at pcf.org slash dogs. And you can donate at pcf. Dot, wait. Donate. Dot, dot, don't, slash donate. And Dr. Simons, I will see you very soon, no doubt. Sorry, Thank I spelled you your name us. wrong at the beginning and at the end as well. I got a little caught up in the sound. Oh, good. Everyone, everyone <laughs> leaned in because of all those I know. I've got problems. people texting me. and Yeah, uh, I saw them here. They went wild on the restream. Well, we'll like, let you go. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. God bless. You're good. And uh, for me, let's see if there's any new data coming out just yet uh, on the COVID update front. I don't know what we're going to do without uh, COVID tracking project. Oh, Somebody's going to have to find me a new uh, epidemiological system to follow that we can rely on. Oh. Don't have March 4th in there. Okay, yet. look at all these people. They're still here. Oops, yeah. let me take off his No, it was a good conversation. It was important there. stuff. And uh, tomorrow, what's coming up? And Susan? I've got like my twitchy guys over there like telling, making me feel better because it's not, not my fault that every switch on my OBS has changed since I got back from New so York. Weird. I don't know. It's some, I don't know, the weirdest thing. So uh, who's up for tomorrow? Tomorrow, tomorrow, I don't think we have there. anybody tomorrow. Uh, oh, I was working on that guy who wanted to um, fight against the teachers union, but I haven't heard back from him. He may, I don't know. I offered him tomorrow. To school guy, yes, that might be interesting. Or Tuesday, but it may be after s- the situation. Um, and then Tuesday, let me look at my schedule. I've got a bunch of bookings. Yeah, and uh, Monday, I, think so I don't have any banners up. I have Thursday. We have doc, doc that. Um, Dr. Z Dog, which is a big one, but we're moving our do- Ask Dr. Drew to. And then um, Tuesday, I don't know why. I don't have anybody yet. <laughs> okay, and Monday, we're going to try to do something? No. So we're. What, tomorrow, we'll do a dose. Okay, we'll be in here tomorrow for a dose. Oh, right. no. Oh, that's next week. Sorry. I'm sorry, you guys. I'm. She's been through a lot. Be easy on her. So it's going to be around God. around noon time. You ask me these questions. Just I can't remember. Off the Just ask him. I have to go order shades for my bedroom, All and right. you have a haircut tomorrow. Yeah. And then you have you're going to do Doctor Gad's podcast. Right. So and Gad we might tomorrow th- ten. Yeah, we might throw in a dose of Doctor Drew after I go to Calico Corners. Calico Corners. <laughs> what is that? What is that? It did, that, uh, I get to pick out the shades, you know, for the town? bedroom because we're building. I'm building an entire wing on my house, and I'm taking care of two apartments and decorating. So and doing these shows, so I'm a little flustered. Um, but I do have some good people. I got Dr. Z Dog. I'm very excited about that. I talked to a woman who was who was um, who uh, this woman from locals who Eliza. From locals, she was uh, a victim of sex trafficking. Oh, yeah, I saw that. We're going to start really talking about that. And then she introduced me to somebody that was part of the whole Epstein thing. So we're going to get her the next week. And then we're going to start working on the uh, consent book with all these people and start building a repertoire of people that are that can teach young people to Great. get consent. That's very cool. But then- um, I'm kind of building that little little world um we have but i i do want to get that other guy on for the teachers unions but tomorrow he may come tomorrow we'll see okay so uh in the meantime we have uh, connecticut texas and mississippi opening wide up am i looking at the right camera yes uh we're opening wide (coughs) up and uh it'll be interesting to see what happens i my prediction is people will continue wearing masks and distancing it won't make a big difference (laughs) Uh, because the social pressure to do it is still massive. Uh, the the um, messaging has been received by most people that motivates them to wear them. So I don't think it's going to make, you know, whether the state should be mandating is a different question than uh, how do we get people to wear masks. I, I, I've said this from the beginning. There are ways to get people to adjust their medical behavior, their health behaviors. Mandates are not a great way to do it. So uh, we've done it maybe the wrong way all the way through this thing. So we'll see. 
And then we'll watch the data. We'll see what happens in Connecticut and Tennessee. And people are becoming apoplectic about it. I think that's a huge mistake. I think it is, um, it, it's, you know, it's, you, you may not want to open it up in your given state. I understand that. But uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens. I think more than the lack of mask mandate, it's opening businesses and moving about that could have a more significant impact. And let's get the vaccines. Remember, we don't want this thing a chance to replicate so it can create uh, many, many uh, divisions and thereby many, many opportunities. I've got dogs down here I'm dealing with. Many, many opportunities He's for sniffing, sneaking, a prostate. sniffing dogs. <laughs> no, they're not. I don't know why they came in you and started dancing one. around here all of a sudden. <laughs> uh, in any event, what was I saying? Oh, my gosh. They're so busy down here. Yes, I see you. I see. Well, they just must have eaten or something. They're in oh. full dance mode. Yeah, usually if yeah. they've eaten, they come up. Yeah. But they like to come up about this time of day and, and get yeah. us to come down and play with them. Okay. Uh, so as I was saying, uh, we will see what the what goes on with the numbers uh, as people move them out a little bit. But get that damn vaccine so we reduce the opportunity yeah. for the virus to replicate so there's less opportunity for variants to develop. And uh, I can stay free of COVID. Thank you very much, which is what I'd prefer to be. Oh, yeah. Florida's been open from the beginning. That's true. It's and been mostly open. Texas is about to be. And, and when and April first, according I was listening to Kelly Victory on, on um KFI. Yeah. She was like, Okay, now if you figure it out, uh, it'll be two weeks later. Oh, yeah. So April first we should know if if Texas is right or if they're wrong. And if Gavin Newsom is right and, or if and, he's and by wrong. the way, everyone's gonna get to open up soon. It's just a matter of when's the right time. So you know, we're just are we at the point where we should be opening up yet based on uh, incidence of the disease and the uh, availability of vaccines. So, I was thinking about the guest yesterday that we had on Ask Dr. Drew, who was fascinating too. The mask, the mask person, and yes. And she, <clears throat> you know, and how she said the particles come through. I didn't really get it when yeah. she was saying it, how it, it's more compressed. Yes. And then the little small particles come out, but those shoot like nine feet. 20 feet. 20 feet. So we're, we're causing a projection of, of virus that we thought we were keeping to right. ourselves. Maybe. Maybe. And I, and so, but there is also data that shows wearing masks. Reduce but I think Kelly Victory said so that too. We should get Kelly Victory in here. All right. Something is may, is working. And the reality is if you have a mask on, you may be protected from that 20 foot spread. Or I also learned we should be coughing to the floor. That's one of the things I did learn. Cough Does anybody want to see floor. Kelly Victory tomorrow at one o'clock? Uh, let's see. I think that's when she has her show though. I'm not sure. At one out. o'clock? Yeah. One or two. Or, She'd probably do it after. We could do it afterwards. Uh, Raise your hand. Kelly is a good guest. Yeah, I mean, she's, I hear on the news, okay, it's a very right-wing channel, okay? I want, Drew worked there for years, and he's not right-wing, but it is super right-wing. And she's very anti-mask, which we are not. We're not. Right, we are not. But, um, but it's just, she, if she heard the thing about the particle spring, I, I remember in my head, and she says, they just don't work. They don't help. They're not. Well, her thing is you're going to get it anyway. I mean, That's I assume sort of that thing. if you've got a mask on, you may not breathe the little particles as much. Right. It's going to be That's correct. helpful. That's my point. I agree with you. But but uh, but Kelly, it makes you want to wear two masks. Kelly's point is you, you're going to get it anyway, and you're if you're going to really, get it, you, it's just sort of not going to do very much in the big picture. Is sort of her point. But I again, I, I don't know. It's I mean, whatever. We were, I mean, it's, we were it's all very the it, hospital system. We really had a problem there for a while, and uh, yeah, we got through it. So. Yeah, but like I see these guys riding a bike around Dodger Stadium with a mask on. That's how scared we've made people. Like you, you can take your mask off when you're riding a bike by yourself in the country, you know. Right. And people are start like they're being brainwashed, and that and, that and, bothers me. And so. Leopold is on the thread reminds us that engineering the environments may be more important than the masks. Yeah, I mean ventilation, UVC light, all that good stuff. That may be more important than anything. I mean, I'm not telling people not to wear masks, but it did really kind of make me think like oh it's not working it's giving us a self well, it, whatever it's just it's look it's examining the actual the actual physical science of the whole thing a false self yeah. of security yeah, when Leo, you Leo's, like the vaccination Leo Prodsky says yes yes engineer the environments that's really the bigger the bigger issue which I think we will come out of this uh, better engineered uh, as a country uh let me see here something. Uh, I love that dogs can I sniff think out Iowa's COVID. Also opening up too. Oh, Joe Giannotti. Why don't um, they just have that at the airport and go? <laughs> Joe Giannotti, do me a favor. Find out where I should be going other than COVID tracking. Where, where can we go next to to watch the numbers? The CDC is still way behind. I I don't know where to go because so, they don't want to show how well we're doing. Whatever, Joe Giannotti, we'll you're going to help take our masks off. Unless you end up doing the COVID tracking, which I, seems like a crazy big job. 
All right, we're going to uh, run. Thank you so much for everyone to for hanging out today. Uh, we will be in earlier in the day tomorrow. And uh, I got to play a couple of ads. You guys can talk among yourself now that Drew's got you all jacked up. Juiced <laughs> up. <laughs> Hopefully we'll make it through the show without my computer crashing and, and all the sound going away. We'll see if these ads work. Wish right. me luck, everyone. Good luck, Susan. <laughs> Here we go. Well, I too have struggled I with hear it. GI issues. Yeah, I years. hear it I too, but syndrome, they may so not. Gut health is extremely important to me. And while gut health awareness has increased, it's led to a wellness trend that's inspired a host of questionable marketing and some false claims. Now, you've seen the word probiotic attached to all kinds of supplements, drinks, even more. They may claim to deliver the healthy microorganisms our gut needs for proper function, but all too often the promises are in fact too good to be true. Thankfully, I'm aware of a company called Thank Seed God. and their flagship product, That's the, how the other one was, Symbiotic. And it didn't work. Okay, Seed's Daily Symbiotic offers 24 clinically researched strains of microorganisms in a single dose. These strains support gut health and can improve regularity and relieve bloating, sometimes within as little as 24 to 48 hours. To me, what really sets Seed's Daily Symbiotic apart is the delivery system. While some products may offer the right strains, they're fragile, they rarely survive the trip through the gut, doesn't get where it needs to go, but Seed uses a capsule in capsule design that helps ensure the probiotic reaches your colon, which is where they often are needed. I've been taking Seed's Daily Symbiotic, and I really encourage you to check out their story and the science behind what they do. To try it for yourself, just go to seed.com slash Dr. Drew. Use code Dr. Drew20 for 15% off your first month of daily symbiotic. That is S E E D.com slash Dr. Drew. Use code Dr. Drew20. I am so grateful for our friends at Blue Microphones. Not only have they completely changed what our show sounds like, they've given me headphones so I can monitor things better. This is the mic for millions of creative people, and now I know why. I'm so grateful for them completely changing the quality of our audio. You'll find blue mics like Yeti and the mouse, which we're using here, both in pro studios and home studios, all literally all over the world. Their popular Yeti caster is a blue Yeti microphone, plus a boom arm system that's behind many of your favorite podcasts. I see run into them all the time, and now I know why. If you've ever thought about creating your own podcast or YouTube channel, Blue can make you sound and look great. Just visit bluemike.com and click get started and you can start telling your story. Headlines have become it's sickening. They've become poisonous. Dissecting headlines. Defying state orders. The Sheriff Bianco not enforcing what the governor is saying. Dialed in with decision makers. Clarify what you actually meant. Get the answers you need. At the beginning of this, we were told, don't wear a mask. Is this really helping? Expect a different kind of newscast. Fox 11 News Special Report. Weeknights at 7 